studies in the ministry of Jesus from Luke's Gospel, reading just a few verses from chapter 8. And I would like to set beside it this morning another few verses, but this time from Mark's Gospel. They are different incidents, of course, teaching different things, but they belong together in a sense that you will understand. So we read then, first of all, from Luke chapter 8 at verse 22. And if you care to put your marker or your finger in the place, we then turn to Mark 6, Mark chapter 6 at verse 45. Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. And so they set out, and as they sailed he fell asleep. And a storm of wind came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? But they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this? that he commands even wind and water, and they obey him. And Mark chapter 6 at verse 45, beginning with the word immediately, which makes you look up the page to find there the feeding immediately, He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, have no fear. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. But they were utterly astounded, because they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. Of the storm in Luke chapter 8, you find also in Matthew and in Mark. But I would like to draw a series on Jesus' ministry in Luke's gospel towards a close with this event. But not quite as simply as that because we are setting this miracle of the calming side by side this morning with another event in the ministry of Jesus which is sometimes confused with it that is the miracle of Jesus coming to the disciples over the water we read of that of course in Mark chapter 6 now that incident is also recorded in Matthew and John but not in Luke And I'm sure you see the point in in bringing that to your attention. So Luke chapter 8, the calming of the storm, 
Mark chapter 6, Jesus walking on the water to his disciples. Now in order to compare them, we bring these together. I'm not trying to make a contrast this morning. We bring them together simply to find the lessons that they are teaching us today. Now, naturally, there are a number of similarities between the two events. There has to be because of the circumstances. There's the sea, although Jesus is crossing it in opposite directions in these two incidents. There's the sea, there's the boat with the disciples and the threat of the storm. And within the boat, there's the increasing fear and panic. And then there's the overawed reaction to the gift of peace. In each case, there's a searching question. In Luke, that question goes very deep. And in Mark, there's a statement about the hard hearts. And that question and that statement sit together also. But the differences are interesting. The great difference is the obvious one. In the coming of the storm in Luke 8, Jesus is with the disciples. But in Mark chapter 6, Jesus is not with them. The other difference is this, that in the story of the coming of the storm, you have something which rises very suddenly. It's a squall. But in Mark, you have something which gradually gets worse and worse and worse. It's a different kind of situation. So, to distinguish then, we have the stilling of the storm in Luke and the coming of Jesus to the disciples in Mark. And let's deal first of all with the stilling of the storm. Now, there's nothing supernatural as far as I can see. There's nothing even particularly unusual about this sudden storm on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is very like a Scottish loch. It's surrounded by winds. And if you've ever sailed on a Scottish loch, you'll know that you can be suddenly keeled over in a sailing boat when you pass opposite a gap in the hills where the wind blows over and then suddenly down upon the loch. In the same way, Luke describes the storm coming down upon the Sea of Galilee, and it does happen. I have a friend to whom this has happened, although in all the times I've crossed the Sea of Galilee, I've never known even big waves. So there's nothing miraculous about the storm. Why then balk at this miracle? Why indeed balk at Jesus walking on the waves? Now, I've made a point to you before, and I want to make it again. And it's this, that if you get hold of the great miracle, the great fact of the Christian gospel, The miracle and fact of the incarnation, the coming of God in the person of God the Son, born of Mary. If you get hold of that great miraculous fact, then this event and all the others of Jesus' ministry are not in the least mind-blowing. They may be amazing, but they are not so amazing as the great miracle of the incarnation, the coming of God in Jesus Christ. This Jesus is God the Son. He is Almighty God, the Maker of heaven and earth, the one through whom all things were made. Therefore the wind and the waves, just as diseases and demons and death itself, must obey His will. You see, that's the point of this story in Luke's Gospel. That's the point Jesus is making. That's the point Luke the Evangelist is making, that if the disciples had only truly grasped the answer to their own question, who is this? 
if they'd only remembered or understood by this stage that this is God in Christ, this is the Messiah. Then perhaps both their astonishment and indeed their fear would have been less. Perhaps even absent. You see, the more we grasp the reality... And the more we understand the meaning of the coming of God in the person of Jesus Christ, the more we understand the incarnation, the more we will be free from fear. We know the word so well, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But how does it go on? That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And in the knowledge of that great purpose in the sending of God's Son, we have an assurance that should free us from many of the fears that we experience in life. In another place, 1 John, we have this statement, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And then the incarnation, and He sent His Son to take away our sins. And you see there how the incarnation is put side by side with the love of God. The incarnation itself is the great act of love. The giving of Christ that he might die to redeem us and restore us to God is the great act, not just of the power and the majesty of God, but of his love. And if the disciples had been able to answer their own question in these terms, who is this? This is God in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Then their fear would have evaporated quicker than the wind and waves subsided. The miracle of the calming of the storm presents no difficulty to those who have grasped the truth of the Incarnation and who even have just begun to understand the meaning of the coming of God in Jesus. If Christ is anything less than God the Son, if He is anything other or less than God Almighty come in the flesh, then yes, I can see how people will have difficulty. And I think that's why people have difficulty with miracles. Because they don't look at the great miracle. They don't understand the incarnation. Or they don't believe it. I struggled with a professor of chemistry whose name I'd better not lift in in public. But I struggled with his unbelief trying to form a statement of faith with a man walking at your side who did not believe in the Incarnation. And because he didn't believe that this was God the Son, he had many problems. He had problems with miracles, he had problems with the Gospels, he had problems with the authority of God, he had problems with heaven and hell and eternity. Well, naturally, he didn't believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You see, in the life and the ministry of Jesus, every miracle follows from, flows from the incarnation. And so the great truth of the stilling of the storm is not the stilling of the storm. It's not. The great truth at the center of this is the presence of Jesus in the storm. The great message for us is something to do with the fact that he was there through this storm with his disciples. You see, the Bible does not promise us in this life the kind of peace that results from the absence of trouble. The Bible nowhere promises us a life free from these storms. But it does promise that we may know peace in them and through them and beyond them. You see, when we sing as we sang this morning the words of the 23rd Psalm, Though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
We are not suddenly changing the subject from singing about the path of righteousness. The path of righteousness goes through the valley of shadow. The way of Christ goes the way of the cross. It goes through the darkness, through the grief, through the pain. The miracle, the central truth of it all, is the presence of God in the darkness, through the pain, through the grief. Now he does calm the storm. And he will still the storms of our pain and our grief and our anguish and our confusion and our frustration. But what we need now is to know that he is with us. We need to know that he is on board. That he's in the boat and in the storm. And when we have him, then we have the peace of the harbor in the midst of the wind and the waves. And if I could just jump ahead to the verse we'll come to in a little bit let me read to you that verse in the middle of that passage that's so easy to miss he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased it was his coming amongst them that brought stillness now whatever their failings and the disciples had many whatever their failings and they are our failings These men had Jesus to turn to in their perplexity and their fears. Master, Master, we are going to drown. And it says there that they were filling with water. If you forgive a personal reminiscence, the words filling with water remind me of the one time when I was drowning. I was pulled out of the Solway by a lifeboat. In fact, there was more of the Solway in me than the lifeboat was sailing, and I'm sure of it by that time. And I remember only one thing about that when I was sure that I was really going to go down for the last time. I was sailing a boat. I was too inexperienced to sail, by the way. I remember shouting out, God, oh God, And my brother to this day is convinced that I was blaspheming. And I wasn't. For me it was the same thing as shouting out, Master, Master, we are going to drown. Do you have Christ with you in the storm? Is he your Emmanuel? Your God incarnate, is he God with you? And can you turn to him when you cannot formulate anything else but his name and cry out, O God, O Master, O Jesus? And it's no blasphemy. Master, help me. Now that's a simple point that is so often missed. That the miracle is the miracle of his presence on the earth. His presence with his people. His presence in the boat and therefore through the storm. Now we may well have need of being challenged about our faith or the lack of it. And the next event The coming of Jesus to the disciples when they were out alone in the boat certainly challenges us very deeply concerning this. Where is your faith, though, is the question here. Now, it might seem to you that that was a very hurtful thing to say to these disciples in their fear. And it can be a very hurtful thing to have somebody say to you, where is your faith? And I have never felt able, never known that I had the authority to go to somebody when they were grieving or confused or in despair and say to them, where is your faith? Although with all my heart it is my privilege and task to bring them to Christ if I can. But you see, this is from the Master's lips. 
These words come from the lips of the one, the only one, who is the object and the focus of faith, and it is for him to say to us, Where is your faith? Do you remember the grief of Mary and Martha at the death of Lazarus? And how they turned to the Lord and said to him, both of them said to him, Master, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And to Martha, who goes on and adds to that question, another question, to Martha, Jesus turns and says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he says the same thing to him, he says to the disciples. He said to the disciples, where is your faith when he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, he says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And if our grief or sorrow or confusion or pain or fear knows no ending, then the Master has every authority to say to us with authority and gentleness, well, where is your faith? And do you really believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Do you? Let's deal very briefly then with the coming of Jesus over the waves. Now, you may say all right to everything that we've shared about the incident in Luke, but now you would want to say, well, this is different, surely. Yes, it's different. He is absent from his disciples. But is he really? I'd invite you to look a little deeper. The story of Jesus on the side of the Golan Hills, looking down upon the Sea of Galilee to the disciples in the boat, has been taken as a picture of the church for many centuries. And it is a picture of the church. Christ Jesus is not physically present with us now. But we are assured that in the glory of the Godhead, Christ intercedes for us and Christ watches over us. Lo, he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And that's why he sent us the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And Mark chapter 6 says that he saw that they were making headway painfully because the wind was against them. He saw their slow progress and their danger. Now, although he was not physically in the boat, he was in prayer. We are told that in Mark. And of course, his prayer included his own. So he is in prayer for them, and he is watching over them, says Mark 6 and 48. And he comes to them, and that's a picture of us in the church. With Christ interceding for us, watching over us, and having promised to return to us in glory. That's a picture of our Christian life. And we find ourselves in both events. Now, you may know very well what it is to have a sudden squall hit your life. When out of a clear blue sky there's a bolt of lightning Totally unpredictable, unexpected, but it breaks you and it makes you afraid. The first story from Luke chapter 8 is there to tell you that in the sudden squalls, turn to him. He is with you. But you may also experience the long struggling battle against a contrary wind and big waves where it goes on and on through the night and you cannot make headway and you dare not turn around because sometimes you know in the waves if you turn around you'll overturn now 
He is with you in the squalls, the sudden storms. And he watches over you in the long struggles. Interceding for you. Watching over you. Promising that he will come to you. Anne Ross Cousins, in her paraphrase of the teaching of Samuel Rutherford, you know the hymn, The Sands of Time, writes, I've wrestled on towards heaven against storm and wind and tide. And that's what it can be like in the Christian life. And, you know, Mark tells us that it was the fourth watch of the night. That is the long last watch, the darkest hour. And when Jesus says to them, where is your faith? He is not saying to them, you don't have any. He is really challenging them with the use to which they are putting their faith. You see, these two incidents are not a challenge to people who do not know Jesus Christ. They are not a challenge to the unconverted. They are not a challenge to those who have not come to know the saving lordship of Jesus Christ, who have not given heart and mind to him, because they have no real hope. None. But these are a challenge to those who have come to Christ and who are struggling with fear or despair or grief. And the question, where is your faith, points us to our faith and asks us to exercise that faith that we might receive more grace to meet our needs. The question is, why are you not putting your faith into action? It's a challenge to disciples. It's a challenge to Christians. And in this great event, the stilling of the storm seems almost secondary. I would say more, it seems almost unimportant when set beside the greater truth concerning the presence of the Lord. You see, that's why Mark ends by telling us that their fear and their anguish was because they hadn't understood about the loaves. They hadn't understood about the feeding of the 5,000. They hadn't got the message. They hadn't believed that this was the Son of God and that his ability to supply the needs of these 5,000 indicates his ability to supply in every need. They hadn't understood and therefore they were afraid, and therefore, says Mark, with blunt honesty as he usually does, their problem was hard hearts, hard hearts in believers. Hard hearts are subject to fear. Tender hearts are not. It's hard-heartedness where we have not come to know more of the grace of our Lord and Savior. It's hard-heartedness that refuses His Lordship that leads us into terror and fear and anguish. Tender hearts are the hearts which Christ can fill with His strength. Now the world says if you've got a really hard core to you, you'll survive. The Bible says if you've got a tender heart, you'll be strengthened. It was hard hearts that made the disciples afraid. And this is where we are all challenged. When the sudden squall comes, or when the storm seems to go on and on and on and never ends, when I begin to wonder if God is really with me, if Christ is present, when we begin to wonder if he cares about us the way the disciples did, and when my hard heart hasn't truly grasped that God is love, 
that he is absolutely faithful and true to himself and his promises and his people. When I wonder if he will truly supply the mercy I need. When all these things make us prone to faithless fear. Then these two events rise to reassure me. The stilling of the storm and the coming of the Saviour across the waves. These things are there in the Bible that our hard hearts may be softened, that we may trust in Him and know that He is with us always and that He is our peace. They are there to teach us that Jesus is still watching over us, still interceding for us, and will come for us. Let us pray.